Yeah, we're going here live. All right. So anyway, we're on Facebook right now, Connor. So. All right. Hi, Facebook. Yeah. So anyway, welcome, welcome back to the studio. It's been like a two and a half, three years or better since uh, we've been able to sit down and talk about what's going on with you and your newest um, work. So we'll go from there. All right. Sounds so I'm going to go go in the camera and I can show you the books. Books here. I'll pull it up here. Not exactly. There it is. Urbanistan, uh, but then Ban Burntas, Urban, uh, Urbantasm. <laughs> it is a mouthful for me for some reason. Urban, Urbantasm. Yeah. But, and um, that's kind of a play on Phantasm, right? Yeah, yeah. Because you know, it dawned on me today when I was preparing for this. I looked up the word. I said, I know what Phantasm, you know, means. I thought, and so I pulled, actually pulled up a dictionary, um, you know, definition of it. And I think it really shows that you are quite clever, <laughs> quite <laughs> clever, quite intelligent. Because I'll bring this up. Um, got to hear the. Okay. Okay, zoom it up. My eyesight's not the greatest. Uh, something apparently seen but having no physical reality, a phantom in, or apparition, an illusionary mental image. In Platonic philosophy, objective rea reality is perceived and distorted by the five senses. So, I mean, this is a perfect fit for what goes on in these novels. Not this novel that I've read. I've Thank read you. the first <laughs> half of it, you know. I mean, it's a great. I just I didn't appreciate the the um, depth of thought you put into this at first, you know. It's been um, well, I've been I've been working on this since 1995, so that's tw so yeah. You can think about a lot of things in uh, 26 years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Now, we're gonna go go to this. You, this is a originally planned for a um, trilogy, but now you threw a monk you threw a monkey were a wrench into the works and you're going to have a fourth book out right well it was originally it was originally just like one huge massive book um and uh and you know publishing these days you know generally they don't they don't do that anymore they want to break things up um but within uh within the book uh as as people kind of learn as they go along uh the number eight is of some significance so the, the, the whole story is divided into, they're called eight revolutions, and each book features two of those. So having four books uh, was sort of like, a, it, it, was a, it was a good structure for it. Yeah, see, I, I always kind of appreciate when an author does that, like um, Milan Kundera, mm. uh, you know, he does that with um, his books, actually, he sees them as like, because he's a musicologist, and his yeah. dad was a, I think he was a director or, um, a conductor at a symphony, symphony or orchestra in, in um, the pro, you know, the Czech Republic. Mm -hmm. um, of course, Milan Kundera's lived in Paris, France, since the '70s because he put himself in exile and he left the country. But uh, I still think he's there too. I don't think everyone went back to you know, you know, Czechoslovakia. Yeah. But um, or Czech Republic. This is <laughs> some old. So I mean, <laughs> we hear it called Czechoslovakia now. It's just called the Czech Republic because you know the splintering yeah. of the former Soviet Union. But uh, he did that too. With like a lot of times, he writes his um, stories like in musical compositions, and mm -hmm. he always sees the last chapters like the coda. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if you ever did. You ever read his work? Or I read the joke and I read some of his essays and criticism. Uh, it's kind of funny. It's it's I I I guess I uh, I read some of his less known stuff. Um, and then you know he's got he's got some stuff that's way more famous than that 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 right. I never checked out. I probably should go back because uh, I, I remember enjoying what I read of his. But this would have been this would have been like twenty years ago, so I don't remember it <laughs> very well. You're pretty young then. What's that? Yeah. Well, that was yeah. yeah that would think it was like a college assignment or something. See, no, see, I can't tell old you because I'm 58, so everybody looks a lot younger to me, except unless they're really older than me. So I'm 43. So really, yeah. See, see, I just. <laughs> I thought I was like, man, this guy's put out a lot of work because you got this isn't the, this is not the only books you've done. You've done several other books before that. Um, why don't you go over? The, let's see. I got it right here in the back of the book. Uh, you're the author of Hungry Rats, mm -hmm. Shattering Glass, and Atlas, which is a short story collection. Mm -hmm. And your work has been published in Vox.com, Belt Magazine, Santa Clara Review, and elsewhere. So I mean, that's mm -hmm. you got some, some significant credits to your credit. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, um. We'll get to the book here. Um, I gotta say that it's basically you've lived in Flint all your life, so you are not, you know, you're not like a one to hesitate to admit that the world you came about and the world you created on paper is kind of intertwined with your reality. Yes, yes, yeah. very much, and uh, and and really like you know, I, I call her Bantasm my big Flint novel because you know, really by the time I was like sixteen, seventeen. 
I had just seen, you know, some things that were so outrageous they had to be written about. I'd met some people who were, you know, so wonderful or terrible that I, I felt like their stories were valuable and, and I wanted to share those as well. And, you know, this whole project has kind of been to find a form and a shape for that and then, you know, put it out into the world in a way that, that you know, uh, a larger audience could, could experience. So I think that's like, um, I just like, I'm really, really uh, struck by the, um, I get the, you have a gift, I mean, to see the, uh, to bring this stuff together and actually draw from, I guess, when I was thinking about this and the, the you know, your work, um, the, um, the expression comes to my mind, and I don't know if it's a full accurate, because I never really contemplated the word, the name, the word surreal, mm -hmm. but surreal, in my estimation, would have to be like basically where there's enough t reality to draw the people in, mm -hmm. but then kind of enough to just like blow the circuits and try to figure it out. It doesn't follow the form and function of what we are normally connected to. Yeah, and that's what these novels kind of do in a way. And thank you. I, I'm. Yeah. I'm. Uh. It, it, it's. It's. I. I have always imagined it as being part of the tradition of magical realism, which. Um, I, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, but um, oh yeah, yes, yeah. Yes. Well, okay, he's he's sort hundred of years like of solitude. The standard bear, yeah, a hundred years of solitude, and that's that's one of my favorite books of all time. But I, I I in recent years have have really gone back to reading a lot of Toni Morrison because I feel like her writing is very much magical realist, but she's doing it in more of sort of a more in sort of an. Uh, you know uh, the context of the United States and and honestly even the Midwest because she grew up in Ohio um, and so you know in, in Toni Morrison's books a lot of the if you if you isolate a, a scene or you isolate a uh, a dialogue there's nothing like that supernatural or impossible happening but if you read one of her books from beginning to end there's this sense of heightened reality, heightened color, heightened senses, and that, that's almost like, almost ghostly to her writing. And, you know, that's, that is sort of a, that's sort of a, a, an aesthetic I w really wanted to tap into because, you know, I know that, um, I know that among, a, like, a lot of artists, uh, you know, uh, writers, musicians, and so forth, um, there's a sense of wanting to be almost hyper-realistic in talking about, you know, Flint and, you know, the way its trajectory has gone over the last 50 years. Um, but, you know, for me personally, you know, the, the, the path I, I found the most compelling is that uh, there's an absurdity to life here. You know, there's, there's you, you get to a point where sort of like uh, the, the dysfunction of this place and the way it interacts with the people who live here is um, almost almost magical or absurd or preternatural, and so for me, like finding a, a style of writing that seems larger than life, ghostly, you know, that to me is is a great way to represent life in Flint. Uh, you know, person I drew from. Um the person I find amazing as a writer, he's gone now, but um, no, Isaac Basha Singer. Okay. And he talked about, he lived so many years of his life in Poland, and then he spent, came to the United States, to, and luckily he came just about the time, before the time of the Holocaust occurring. Mm -hmm. He was mm -hmm. Jewish. And he had this, his st st short stories are the finest that you could ever read. I'm serious, they're masterpieces. His novels are great, but his short stories were his, his form that he was, he, sh he stayed in, and he was perfectly fine staying in that, because Dad's excellent. He was excellent at that. Mm -hmm. He's a master of it. And uh, he would have that, like there's like the macabre and the supernatural intertwined with the mundane and the everyday. Yeah. And uh, see, I, 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 the other day I was posting something about here on Facebook, and I want to read this. I'm going to tell them, so don't get too critical. It's just a posting, but I was going to post something on Memories of Flint, and when I went back to the post, somebody actually deleted it, so I just copied and uh -huh. put it on my own wall. But I was talking about Flint. Well, here's what I said. Um, I said here. I bet all those people who are mad at the bashers don't live in Flint any longer. And because some people nostalgize this place when they live outside of it. You know, they don't still. They're not dealing with the, the grittiness of it, the grittiness, the down and outness of it. All we do is look back over our shoulders at a memory of Flint that is no longer exists. The city has bad things going on. It has some good, very few, you know, a number admittedly, good things going on for it too. Now, no, yesteryear was admittedly perfect. Mm -hmm. And my point is basically. 
everybody nostalgizes looking back they make it like such a fun but okay they go back into the second world war and they say they talk about the music or the movies or whatever kind of disregarding or putting on the back burner horrific things that are unfolding in Europe and around the world at that mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. um, the 1950s, you know, the civil rights era was developing. They wanted to look at everything like happy days, but for some portion of the population, that kind of, those conditions, mm -hmm. those happy, well, uh, well, helicon, how do you say, helicon days, or, or uh, Hel happiness, Allison, maybe? I I idyllic know. lifestyle didn't yeah. exist. You yeah. know, I can't remember the name, it sounds stupid, but anyway, anyway, um, there's never an ideal perfect, there's never an ideal point of human existence. Right. No, but we have a tendency to gloss over that in memory. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's like, see, what's this? These, these, this novel that I read. I was just reading the first one, but um, it looks at the the grittiness of reality, and also there's still kind of something's going on too that on the under the surface. Mm -hmm. But that's what all that is. We don't know the motives of people. We don't know what's going on beyond our little yeah. sphere. So that's. That's excellent. I mean, that's really... Thank you. That's gifted right there to see that, you know, and try to depict that. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned, like, nostalgia uh, in, in the context of, of the books because, um, you know, I, I, I've always kind of felt like the second one, I think that's this one, is, is, is the weirdest. It's the one that I think people find the most inaccessible, and it's because part of the reason for that is that, uh, you know, the, the, the first book, I mean, this is, this is like a... This is a classic, like, trilogy, quadrilogy structure. But, you know, the first book, you're establishing the characters, you're establishing the setting, you're pulling people in. And you, ha you have to save some of the juicy, you plant the seeds for it, but you, you really save, like, a lot of the heft of the plot um, for what comes later because you need to familiarize people with the universe that they're entering, so to speak. So in the second book, I really wanted to... Uh, you, you know how you know like how they say like how Rasputin was like murdered in like seventeen different ways. He was shot like three times. He was thrown in the river to drown. He was poisoned. He had his throat slit. You know, like I, I kind of wanted to do that to our Flint nostalgia because it is well one. It, it, it's really kind of frustrating and annoying when you encounter that that you know very rosiness. Uh, you know, in conversation after conversation. But I also think it's actively. Uh, damaging when thinking about moving the, the city forward because people are are people are operating on an assumption that the best solution is to go back to the way things were and yet the way things were planted the seeds for the way things are now so uh, a lot of the second book was preoccupied with um, with taking that argument and you know, connecting the past to the present in a way that shows that, you know, uh, you, you, you kind of, you can't separate in some sense uh, the prosperity, you know, the money, the jobs that General Motors brought us from the fact that it, it would literally like snow soot on the city or, you know, like I, I know, you know, the old farmer's market, uh, you know, o o off a uh, Fifth, Fifth Avenue, they could never get the parking lot resurfaced adequately, and it's because it was basically built on industrial garbage. So you can't separate the prosperity of our past from the wreckage of the present. They are connected to each other. And I think that that is, that is a fact that any discussion about, you know, where Flynn is going to go in the future, you know, you have to, you have to reckon with that, with that relationship. That's definitely true. I mean, because um, I mean, I've was I had a unique position in this uh, this city. My dad wasn't a um, GM employee, you know, mm -hmm. wasn't a UAW member. So I mean, I lived outside of the. I was always kind of. I always considered myself kind of the outsider, although I was in the mix. Now. I grew up mm -hmm. right between the smokestack of Buick and AC. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But my dad worked at the main post office here in Flint. His day, his day was filled with just pushing carts around, loading, and unloading trucks, sorting mail, mm -hmm. and getting the mail out to the people, and sending mail away from this place. So. Yeah. Um, and then also my family also owned restaurants and stuff, so we had a good sweat. We had a good connection, but we're still outsiders because we weren't in the mix. We didn't have the mm -hmm. same concerns mm -hmm. as the eighty-five percent of our pop, you know, the population around us. But then again, we definitely weren't isolated or insulated because the restaurants did well because the shops were doing so well. Right, right. So I mean, we're all intertwined, and that's the thing is, um, if we have a sense too. There was never. I go back to a Billy Joel song. He goes, uh, "The past wasn't as good as always as it seems." You know, mm -hmm. the past wasn't as good as it seems. And I've already alluded to that. You know, when I, that posting I did, it's like 
for some people, it was great for a good portion of the population. But there's always a minority that was not enjoying those benefits. Yeah. And uh, and a lot of your characters now. Okay, well, how long did you do this span from the beginning of this to say that we're you're anticipating the uh, the fourth one to end? Uh, what are you talking about for these characters? Uh, how how many years? Yeah, years. Yeah, how it's many about years three been? years. Most three of the years? action takes place uh, between August of 1993 and August of 1996. And that's when you were coming of age yourself, you're right. You're, you're y yeah, I'm a little bit older than yeah. most of the characters here. Um, but yeah, I would have been I would have been 15 in 93 and then turned 18 in late 96. Yeah, see, so just I was already in my Let's see, late 20s, early 30s. I was born in 60. Yeah. So I was like, you know, I was older. I mean, and the thing is, I had the ad advantage or disadvantage, too. My parents were older than most of my friends' mm -hmm. parents. My parents were in their 30s when I was born. Me and my sister were born. I'm a twin. And so we came out in 63. Came out and came out of the womb in 63. And um, my friends' parents were just having kids the first time in mm -hmm. the 70s. You know, like say, when we were going to school, you know, just a few years before 68, yeah. 69. So that was their first set of kids. Where my my brother was already ten years older. My mom had my brother already from a first marriage. Okay. So I had that distinct. Yeah. I've, I was in between generations. My own brother's generation was different than my generation, because ten years I think it's a half of a generation, but that's insignificant. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. It it yeah. makes a difference. I, I weirdly I feel like the same, the same like split identity a little bit a little bit because I think the term they came out with for people I was born in seventy eight and I think the term for people born. 77 to 83 um, is they're calling it Xennial because it's between Gen X and, and the Millennials. And, you know, speaking personally, um, I think more of my friends are a little bit younger than me. So, so, you know, most of them would consider themselves Millennials. Certainly my younger brother and sister do. Um, but then if you talk about, you know, the way I relate to like culture, music, technology, television, film, you know, all of that stuff, I feel much more connected to that era right before me than after and so it is like uh it is like a little bit little bit split the you know the these labels make things seem a, a lot tidier than they are in our sort of lived experience that's exactly see when you study history when you go into social sciences mm -hmm. they have a tendency to, to um they tell you not to label stare uh, categorize or stereotype mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. but that's exactly what those disciplines engage in like mm -hmm. anthropology psychology sociology they find somebody with certain attributes or born in a certain period of time and they put a label to it. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, I see that what you're saying, there's a blending, there's a melding, and there's kind of a blurring. Because you might have been like your age, but you have something like harkens back to even further, like maybe your grandparents' age. Mm -hmm. Something you connected with. For some reason, it resonated. Oh, yeah. And so, yeah, very so much. And so you've seen the gender, in, this, in the novel, the first one, because I haven't got the chance to read the mm -hmm. second one yet, and obviously I haven't got the chance to read the third one, but um, you can see a kind of a generational... The, the gap there and there's some issues there too coming from that isn't there yeah i mean uh you, you, do you mean uh, are you thinking of like john between his parents and yeah 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 well you know john's yeah john's father is is uh is a shop rat and you know basically went right in you know i think i think uh, in the story he uh he actually dropped out of college but you know went back and into the shop and has basically been there ever since and of course you know it's it's a fictional setting you you compress time a little bit so, you know, uh, a lot of, like, the uh, downsizing that happened with General Motors and Flint between uh, the late 70s and, you know, I mean, I, I, I guess it's, it's, I guess, you know, probably it, it didn't stop until the early 2000s that things sort of stabilized at, like, 3,000 or whatever it is now. Yeah. But, um, you know, that's kind of compressed here, and that's because you want, to, you want to be able to talk about, you know, both extremes of it. But yeah, you know, basically the idea that, you know, as with our parents, you know, there was this mindset that, you know, uh, you could get you could get fired from Buick, you could walk into Chevrolet and, you know, you, you didn't need any sort of like academic credentials. Um, and yet, you know, people were able to 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 build lives around, um, you know, over several generations, uh, you know, this um, this employment in the shop. And so then, of course, you know, when all that went away in a very permanent way, starting in the late 70s, um, you know, I remember being told, uh, you know, that those jobs were not going to be there uh, for me, that, you know, they, it, 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 it wasn't so much a good thing or a bad thing in my family. It was just like, uh, 
this is this is not available as an option. Those jobs they were there before; they are not there now. And uh, and I, I think that that is that is you know reflected in the story um, is that you know John and his friends you know they're they're in their like early teens then and you know they're going into a world without you know a big automotive employer that can you know find them a place to work in their hometown so yeah see I just I saw that too see I saw a little bit more. Because I was already part of these, you know, the employment. My family didn't have much. I had uncles mm -hmm. that belong, you know, worked for a GM. But on the main, like the, my everyday family, my f parents and stuff. I mean, we we definitely felt the pain when they got, you know, there was a mm -hmm. big shuffle and uh, there was this vacuum created when those jobs, you know, left here. We definitely we nobody was unaffected. Right, right. There wasn't a business. There wasn't a person. They had to see friends or family members. Had to seek out other places to live to, because they couldn't have careers here. Yeah. And that drain of, of the emotional drain as well as the what they call the brain trust drain, the brain drain. You know the 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 intelligence, the training, all went out to other places. Mm -hmm. And um, you see that too. You I mean you got a lot of authors who are expats of Flint, like yeah. um. The tearing down Flint or something like that. The uh, Gordon Young. Young, yeah, yeah. He's, he's he also reviewed your book, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Put favorably well too. I, I, yes, he's he's a he's a great guy. I actually, um, I visited him in uh, California when I was, uh, you know, doing the the promo stuff on on book one. <laughs> so you did travel for first one then? I did, I did. You know, it's 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 kind of funny. Um, I have, um, you know, I th I think we settled on the title of producer, but but basically trying to think it's such a long and rambly story but I think I can condense it to like 30 seconds um, I shot this book around everywhere to agents um, I probably sent out queries to 200 250 agents and some of them would request the manuscript but uh, nobody would wanted to publish it uh, it was too weird I mean it, it it's it's really really long it's it's very literary but it's got younger protagonists so you know they want to slot it as like literary fiction or they want to call it like young adult fiction because of the age um, and so finally, you know, after doing this for, for two, three years, and I think, I think after I queried agents, I started, you know, contacting small publishers directly. Um, I was about ready to like, I, I wasn't going to give up, but I really had no idea what my next steps were. And a friend of mine from, you know, he actually grew up on the east side over on Mabel in Minnesota, uh, Paul Lathrop. He's, you know, one of my oldest and best friends, and he had offered to finance uh, the publication of the book. And so, you know, I remember we, he lives down in Troy now. I drove down to Troy. We met at this like diner. I remember getting like the key lime pie and it was amazing. And, uh, you know, but we just hashed out like how we were going to do this. And, you know, I'll tell you, it's been a really, really positive experience because in some ways I've, I've, you know, had some of the budget to work with that a midlist author might have, you know, in terms of like uh, marketing and promotion, um, in terms of being able to like, hire a great editor and a great cover designer, um, you know, and, 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 and all of those. Um, but at the same time, I've, I've been able to retain a lot of the creative control that comes with, um, with self-publishing. You know, if, if you meet anybody who, who goes through traditional publishing, like the first thing they'll tell you is that you have absolutely no say, like zero say over what kind of a cover you get. And, of course, that's like, I mean, that's just the first thing, but that's bonkers because lots of people do buy books based on their covers, and a bad cover can sink a book. Like, you have a, the most beautiful, brilliant story, you have a crappy cover, nobody's buying that book off of a bookshelf. They'll just move on to the next thing because it looks sloppy or unprofessional, or it's telling them that it's a different sort of book. So, you know, like, I got to, like, go through the whole process and all of these books, you know, our designer, Sam Perkins Harbin, he's also a Flint guy. He went to Flint Central. Um, uh, he, like, came up with this yeah, scheme to have sort of this there. evolving the skyline. Yeah, moving through the rest of them, yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. you see it, because um, you, you're off camera there. So oh, right sorry. The camera. <laughs> yeah, but, um, no, I think that, um, yeah, the, the adage, you know, you can't judge a book by the cover, mm -hmm. is totally disregarded 90% of the time. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean... I think that's a great, that's, and I kind of like the fact that the books kind of resemble each other, but slightly significant enough to, significant enough to, different enough to make, demarcate them from one to the other. You know, that's good, because you're going to have people grabbing them up, and they're saying, oh, wait a minute, I got this one already. <laughs> you know, so there's enough there, difference, that they can tell the difference. I love working with uh, a good designer, because, you know, Sam's talent and training and his experience, uh, you know, 
you know, blow any sense that I might have over like um, what makes a good cover out of the water. And yet being able to collaborate with him, being able to have multiple discussions over it, you know, he's been able to familiarize himself with the story in a way that allows him to make the cover part of the story in a way that it is, is not typical for the industry because usually there's just no communication uh, between an author and a, a, uh, a cover designer and honestly most of the time probably minimal communication between a publisher and you know other than like a, a one paragraph this is what the story is about but I'll just give an example that's kind of it's a little bit of an Easter egg but I, I, I do think you know people that are watching this might like so if you look at the cover of book, book one uh, you see this sort of industrial skyline like these are all factories um, am I holding it a good place yeah. Okay. So yeah, you've got all these factories, but you also see bottom left and stuff, a small house with a, a light on in the second story window. And, uh, you know, not really a lot of explanation about what all that portends other than just this, this is an industrial city or an ex-industrial city. So then, you know, book two basically shows a neighborhood like, you know, a city neighborhood, it's, I'm kind of imagining it, like, you know, the main character lives on a neighborhood that's kind of modeled on, like, Court and Corona, so you've kind of got that mid-century bungalow-type house. But uh, book three, which is coming out in a couple weeks, shows, you know, a house that's in, in very, very bad shape in sort of like a, a, a tattered, splintered landscape. Okay, so the book in, the, the, the house in book three is the same house on the cover of book one that's very small and uh, you know it's just very very largely magnified and you know people who follow the story um, will understand the resonance of that because there is a there is a description of a um, industrial area that is not illuminated at the end of book one and at uh, in book three they actually discover that there is a house in the midst of that so what's really cool is that when you as an author and publisher are working with the editor are working with the cover designer you're able to incorporate all of those things into the storytelling more fully and I just think that's an extraordinary opportunity because so many people do judge the book based on right. its cover, well, then make an awesome cover that helps tell the story. No, I think that's genius, basically. I mean, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie um, Gangs of New York. Yes. <clears throat> Did you see at the end, or remember at the end, they mm -hmm. show the graveyard where people are buried, and they show the, ci the, the, the city behind it changing, <laughs> you know, going from what the position it was in where the last character was buried there yeah. to the time of, like, uh, more current times, the city being built up around it. And see, that's what I like here, because, see, unfortunately, I don't know, I have I have mixed feelings about Flint. I mm -hmm. see it's basically, it's like, um, it's a ghost town. Mm -hmm. It's a... Um, a basic a phantasm. I mean, basically, it's illusionary. Yeah. But the thing is, this backstory, like me and my friend would walk past these old abandoned houses, mm -hmm. and we used to, before they were torn down, we'd say, "Could you imagine of all the all the activity that went on in this household since it was built in nineteen hundreds, nineteen twenties? Yeah. And the stories that could be told out of that family alone that lived there, these families that maybe moved in and out of this place. Yeah. It's and it's like sometimes I wonder. I get really kind of creative, I think, and trying to see, so see if I can hear the story or hear the, the echoes of something that went on be fast. Because when you see a town so destroyed, like I have seen Flint, yeah, you just want to kind of cling to something. And yes. I, and yes. Yeah, I, hate, I hate that part about myself sometimes because I feel that I, I will dream at times of the, um, this, up here on Franklin, just not too far from the studio, back what it was like in the 1970s when they had Ben Franklin's store, O'Connor's Drug Store. Right. They had a, a good a Goodwill store, or, yeah, Goodwill store up there on the strip, little like little strip mall thing right there, it's a little strip yeah. of buildings. And I actually see that in my dreams. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. No, me too. Um, it, it, like sometimes, like literal literal dreams, I will imagine uh, landscapes as part of the city, and they will. Uh, they will look like almost like they're of two or three different eras, like you know, because there will be stuff that's more recent superimposed on stuff from stuff from before. Um, yeah, absolutely, and and I'll tell you, like you know, 
uh, one of the other things that, that I think is so, so striking that I, I think that I think there's a lot of stuff, not even like in a, in a like, oh, this is the worst place you can imagine sense, but there's just a lot of features of living in a place like this that you would not understand or recognize if you hadn't lived there. So, for example, one thing I don't think people in more prosperous populated areas like consider is that when a house is abandoned or when a building is abandoned, uh, it is usually abandoned in a hurry. And what that means is that all the stuff, all the signatures that made that place, that house distinct from all the other houses on its block, that's all left behind. So if you go into an abandoned house or an abandoned building, you are going to find all the things that are the stereotypes and everything that people are going to expect. You'll find smashed windows and spiders and, and gang tags and you know stuff like that. But you will find like the relics of people's lives. You will find photographs. You will find like places where people have like marked a kid's height yeah. on the wall. You know, all of these houses. I've never been in like, you know, uh, in in a place like this that hasn't left palpable traces of what it was before. And it gives it all this sort of like uh, spooky, well, you know, haunted quality. Yeah. I can see that fully. I mean, and living in Flint, you basically get connected to that. See, um, Isaac Basham Singer mm -hmm. wrote in Yiddish. And people would ask him that because he'd write in Yiddish and have it translated into English. And he could speak English himself, but um, and quite well. Mm -hmm. But he said, um, why do you write in Yiddish? And he would respond, he said, because it's the... Um, it's a dead language, so the best way to tell the ghost stories is in a dead, dead language. Because it's yeah. like... Uh, and it really wasn't. I mean, but there's not that many people speaking Yiddish now. Yeah. Like, and there's, but years ago, before that, there had been Yiddish theaters, Yiddish, that, you know, plays being put out all the time in Europe, even here in the United States, mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. New York, and cities where they had large Jewish populations. So, um, I can see when I was reading that, I never it started clicking with me about you know, I saw parallels between what he was talking about and what was going on because I was reading him in the early '90s, and of course we're going like we've been going through is the basically the decay of the city, the death of the city. Yeah. And um, I could see, I started I clicked well with I connected well with his what he was saying on that because of that yeah yeah because yeah. um now I just think that just so I just can't get over the fact that the, the choice of title for this it just it's so there's more depth to it than just the surface you know that much more it's like uh well, like I said the Platonic th uh, philosophy it said it's like you know if for the definition it's like uh, it's we're corrupted by the it's it's a reality but it's corrupted by our senses yeah and that's exactly why we are when we view life yeah well and it's kind of one of the things that um y you know and and i honestly think that i think that most art that is developed over a period of time operates this way but um you know you you learn that you make like lucky choices i mean just just by dumb luck and then sometimes they become uh more profound than you intended for them to be. Because I remember, you know, when I was starting to work on this, again, this is like back in 1995, I was still in high school. Um, my brother was reading um, Lewis Carroll's book, Phantasmagoria. Um, and there was just something about that portmanteau of words um, that I found really, really cool and compelling. And that's sort of, you know, the first thing that led me to this, this, uh, this title. Um, and yet, you know, watching, well, you know, considering like Flint's trajectory up until that point and then watching how it has continued to fare over the last 26 years since, um, you know, you could do a lot worse than, than a, a, a title which talks about images and memories and, you know, the way they impress themselves upon the presence even after their physical presence is gone. Um, so that was a case where, you know, I like lucked into uh, a title that was much cooler and and you know more fruitful to explore than I than I really intended it to be. I remember my ex girlfriend. She was a she had <laughs> taken literary classes in uh, college. Mm -hmm. She went to Oakland University, and um, she said something I thought was bizarre, and I thought was, I disagreed with that at the time. But now looking back, I think her professor and her and she were correct on this. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, the author 
really fully doesn't understand everything they're writing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Because, see, the thing is, when you when you write something, you're presenting to the outside, and somebody doesn't have your experience, you can't help. When you read something, you're going to be judging it from your perspective. Yeah. And that's what all people are going to do with your work. Yeah. Yeah, you, they're going to read something into it from their, maybe something clicks, maybe something totally mm-hmm. opposes their, mm-hmm. their, their worldview. And they're going to react to that. But that's a good thing about literature. Oh, yeah. Because it shouldn't be comfortable. It shouldn't always be comforting to the reader. Because sometimes things we should be discomforted over. You know, I mean, that's the purpose of journalism, as I would think. Yeah. Know? Well, and I think that that's one of the functions of, of fiction. I mean, you know, uh, one of the things I end up thinking about a lot is, um, you know, lots of times people you know, people have, have suggested that I go more into journalism. And, I mean, I've done journalism. I'm not, not very good at it. But, you know, you do, you, you, the, the utility of journalism, the usefulness of journalism is, is obvious. Um, and with fiction, it's a little bit more elusive. Um, but one thing I, 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 you know, believe very, very strongly about fiction is that, you know, fiction is able to introduce you to characters, um, you know, make you connect with characters, make you empathize with characters, um, you know, that you might not in, in real life. And then once you feel like you've got this bond with this made-up character, then they are able to expand your perspectives and your insights into the world by showing you something different. But I mean, I also think, think you're right about the idea that, you know, no, no book is going to be quite the same experience for any two, two readers because everybody is, you know, the, the words are almost sort of like a schematic, but you're constructing the story out of your imagination, you know. Everything is interpreted to some extent, and you know there's always going to be places where what the author is imagining and what the reader is imagining are going to diverge, and and I know that like a lot of uh, a lot of writers find that to be kind of a terrifying prospect, but I think that's one of the ways that you know we're able to read something that was written a hundred years ago or four hundred years ago and still connect to it is because, you know, the ideas and, and the characters and the language are sufficiently uh, not tethered to, to, you know, the writer's own experience uh, that somebody from the future can extract meaning from it. I mean, Shakespeare would be like the obvious example is, you know, there is nothing in this room that I'm sitting in that would be familiar and comfortable to Shakespeare, and yet I can pick up one of his bajillion plays and read it and find characters I care about and find scenes that I think are funny and find profound truths about the human condition and, you know, all of that stuff. And that would not be possible if I could only experience those plays in the same way that Shakespeare intended them to be experienced. You know, reading this, reading this, and seeing the Flint, and I know mm-hmm. it's based kind of on Flint. It's got a different name. What's mm-hmm. the name of the book uh, for the, uh, the city? T- huh? Akawe. I don't know. Where did you get that name from, by the way? Uh, it's Ojibwa for first. Okay. First, okay. Yeah. And Let's it's actually, it it's different from our first. I, I found this out, like, embarrassingly late in the process. Um, but in the, uh, it, it's, um, in the uh, Anishinaabe language, there are multiple words for first. So a kawe would not be like um, uh, I was the I was the first uh, person uh, to to live in this place, um, but it would be like uh, you know first I had the soup and then I had the salad. So um, so a kawe means first in in that sense as being the uh, origination original movement in a sequence of events. Well, that's, that's kind of cool, though, because it's actually, it's actually not, it's actually kind of, let's um, show, how can I say this, but, um, but it's like, basically, this was the first incarnation, maybe, of the city, you know, what we dealt with was the first form of the city, mm-hmm. and now we're dealing with the later developments, the transitional stages, I mean, I could just see that, maybe, maybe I'm off on that, but then again, that's what literature is going to do, a lot of people are going to go off mm-hmm. on tangents that the original author had yeah. intended. Yeah, oh, I, I definitely think so. Yeah. And, and again, you know, like, I, you know, I, I have, um, you know, I have a friend that lives in Syracuse, New York, 
um, and she she grew up in uh, New York City and then moved to Syracuse. Um, you know, so when she read book one, I didn't want her to uh, read it the way I do as a Flintstone. You know, I'm going to read it as a Flintstone, and I'm going to think about the Mots, and I'm going to think about, you know, U of M Flint. I'm going to think about Buick and all of that. You know, I wanted her to read it uh, and, uh, and you know, see what it had to say about Syracuse or say what it had to say about New York and, you know, have some relevance to her experiences. So I think that that's, again, where, you know, the imagination of the writer and the imagination of the reader, it's, it's really kind of a dance. It, it, you know, this is kind of a weird idea, and I, and I feel like it's half-formed for me, and so I, I, it's not a finished idea. But I think there's this idea that um, in the performing arts, in theater or in music, if you go to a live performance... There's no question for you that it is live. Like, uh, you know, you're at a play and the actor can say the lines that are in the script or they can forget or they can do something completely different. Um, and you as an audience member, you're uh, under absolutely no illusion that, you know, what is happening in front of you is, uh, is changing in real time, is actually happening in the moment. And I have gradually come to the view that literature is more like that than we think it is. I think there's a temptation to think that because, you know, these are printed words on a page and they are going to be the same printed words on the same page, like 10 years if this sits on a bookshelf, um, that, you know, the act of reading is, is not live, that it's not interacting with something that is changing in real time. And yet, your imagination is what's processing the story. It's what's making the story live. You know, it, it's almost like a, a, a player piano. You know, the book is the tread, and your imagination is what is responding to that and creating the music. So I, I now look at reading as being just as dynamic and changeable as a musical or a theatrical performance. I definitely agree on that because, I mean, I've read books when I was in junior high and put them totally, I remembered everything in them, I thought. And then mm -hmm. when I went back and I reread them in a much older, in a much older state of my life, and um, I guess I'm supposed to be a mature age <laughs> position in my life. And I brought more, I brought different things into it in that reading than I did when I first read it. Mm -hmm. And there was more maybe, some things I maybe I was in agreement with back then, I've questioned now. And then now, then above also some things I totally embraced then, I no longer mm -hmm. want to do be part of. So, so I mean, um, there's several. Um, yeah, I think that basically it is, and it's like it's weighed over time. I mean, of uh, literature, and I can see definitely these books. You know, your books being read one point in some like a young reader's life, mm -hmm. like a teenager, and then they sit on the shelf, and then maybe they're reading it to their kids or pass them over to their kids 20, 30, 40 years down the road. And the kids are going to come along and ask questions that do from the reading of it mm -hmm. that they never even saw or even thought about. So that's what literature is. I mean, you ever seen the movie um, Shadowlands about C.S. Lewis? It was a long time ago, but yes, yes. Remember, the, he was talking to a former student on a train. He just incidentally met on a train, and he said they're in the they're in the they're out there on the back smoking, uh, like you know, out on the back or in the open area. Mm -hmm. And he said his dad told him. That we read to know that we're not alone. Yeah, I like yeah. that. And so, I mean, when you're dealing with human experiences, like especially the characters in these books, they are some are likable, some of are somewhat doing contentable stuff. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, like I watch Sopranos. I mean, there's some things yeah. about Tony Soprano you would like the guy. Yeah. If you just saw that part of him. Right. Right. And so it's like it's the they're they're, they're, they're you're. Characters are definitely three-dimensional. I can see that. You know, Thank they're you. not flat-line caricatures or whatever. They're they're living people. You can actually see them brought out in from the book, put in front of you as people. If I mean, I, I don't know that it's I don't know that this book is widely read enough to really like attract a lot of fire and criticism. But you know, it's gotten some limited criticism, and a lot of it has been about you know how 
unlikable some of the characters act at some of the times, especially like characters that you're supposed to identify with and relate to, you know, sometimes do some really, really dislikable things. And, you know, I wasn't going for, you know, creating like, you know, a Colton, Colton Caulfield like type anti-hero. But ultimately, like, this was about people that I knew in this town and, you know, interacted with and, you know, their lives. And you, you, you have to, if you're going to bear witness to somebody's experience, you have to be truthful. I mean, that really is, like, the first requirement. So, you know, I, I, I don't think, I don't think there's any character, not one in this book, who, who is perfect, who doesn't make, like, you know, some really, really cringy to terrible mistakes along the way um, and yet you know there's a lot of them that I like and that I am pulling for and then I, I want them to figure things out and you know come out okay on the other side so to speak yeah because I um, I definitely could see that certain characters would be more um, lovable for an mm -hmm. author there are probably some that they could hardly if you're writing a long series you could hardly wait to kill off or oh, maybe yeah. have them leave the scene you know leave town or whatever yeah. but uh some some people I could I see that movies and see that in stories that I've read you know some people that some characters I should say uh, that definitely are more likable yeah lovable than others yeah so I mean so anyway um I think these are, I think these are great books I think that um who who do you think want to be the uh, ideal target audience for your books I mean yeah well so uh, book marketers always want to break it down by age um, because with fiction you know you've got you've got writing for youth which is breaking down by age and then uh, and then you've got writing for adult which is broken down by genre um, and you know part of I think the resistance to getting this published was that it kind of defies that categorization to begin with um, so I would say you know um, I have known I've known a fair number of young people who have read these books and enjoyed them. Um, I know, you know, a lot of adults that have read them and enjoyed them. Um, my daughters have asked when they can read it. I'm like, when you're 16, because there's some very mature content in it. Um, but I know that other other friends have let their children who are younger than that read them. Um, but I would say, I would say, um, it's. Uh, I would say it's um, it's magical realism. I would say people who want to be challenged might enjoy it. Like, you know, there's some dense wordplay in there. There are some historical tangents that go on for a long time. There's lots of slang. Um, there's, you know, lots of illusions. So it's, it's not something where you're going to, you're not going to skim it and get a lot out of it. Um, I'd say that would be one thing. And then the second thing is you know it's it's a deep dive into the personalities of these people that are living through some very very trying times through this very challenging environment and so if you feel like you want to spend some time with people you know who are discovering themselves or coming of age or trying to figure out how to grow up um, or making lots of mistakes along the way and trying to make them right um, you know then then that might be who it would appeal to yeah because um I know a lot of people would probably some probably find some of the um dialogue and stuff offensive i mean the, the when you my friend brings up south park you know how the the kids on south park would talk you know the cartoon mm -hmm. series or animated series he said he said everybody is like oh my god those kids are swearing so bad and he's like basically he said, that's how me and my friends talked about talked when we were yeah. in the same grades you know yeah well i wanted to get the dialogue absolutely as close to life as i could like i mean i it, it's going to be limited by my own ability to some extent but, you know, I, I wanted these kids to talk the way the kids I knew talked. I wanted the grown-ups, you know, the adults to talk the way that the adults I knew talked. Um, and so, yeah, there's, there's, there's no apology about that. Like, you yeah. know, these, lots of times these kids are trying to outdo each other in terms of, like, how, how you know, how they're, how they're trying to be outrageous. They're trying to shock each other. So, naturally, like, you know, they might be, in some cases, shocking the reader as well. <laughs> It's hard to shock teenagers to shock other teenagers, though, <laughs> because yeah. basically they did roll the punches more. They try to up the game, mm -hmm. you know. So I mean, no, I think it's like um, very realistically done, though. The, the dialogue Thanks. and dialogue's hard, mm -hmm. very hard, because it's a lot of times you read. I mean, Lu George Lucas, for example, in his movies, 
Oh yeah. Dialogue sucks. Yeah. It's horrible. It's not a strong suit. No. <laughs> no, it's no, it's not. I mean, the visual effects, the the mm -hmm. the um, the speed of delivery, whatever. But no, this dialogue is very stilted. Yeah. Wretched. Yeah, I would say not good at all. And um, and I love his. I mean, I love the original trilogy. Mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. I can't stand anything that came after that. I really can't. You know, just discussed you know contemptible i think but you know but then again it could be this totally nostalgia might be off because i just see they developed so much uh dependency on the flash and the, the special mm -hmm. effects and the um the imagery they can create now compared to what they had back then yeah star wars is such a fascinating case in point because there's almost exactly 20 years between like each franchise and so there's been a whole new crop of kids that have grown up with each one right. um i i uh i i i never saw the most recent one the, the episode nine i i kind of liked like the seventh and eighth ones but i really really remember detesting the prequels and i've run into people who are about 20 years younger than me that really love them like oh we all had darth maul lunch pails and stuff like that and see i was in college at the time you know everybody that i knew was basically mocking you know the the, the prequels so that's that's my but i think i think your point about the dialogue is that's pretty much true all around all along like you know i i, I think my favorite story about that was um you know the empire strikes back at the end where um I guess, spoiler for anybody who hasn't ever seen The Empire Strikes Back, but, um, you know, where Han Solo is, like, about to be frozen, and uh, Leia says, I love you, and in the script, in George Lucas's script, he says, I love you too, which is completely out of character for that character, and, and does kind of rob the scene of a little bit of its badass factor, and so Harrison Ford ad-libbed, uh, I know, which which is, you know, one of the most uh, revealing moments of that whole movie. Um, so yeah, I, I think I think that the, I think the dialogue has not been the strong suit of uh, now I'll get all these Star Wars haters on me, but <laughs> but anyway, so I'm going to wrap this interview up because sure. I want people to get to the Jew the, the the thrust of it. Uh, where can you people get your books? Uh, you can get it on Amazon. If you live near Flint, you can and should go to Comma Bookstore downtown, and they've got copies. Um, I, I think Totem has copies. I should check in with them and see if they do. Uh, but it's all on Amazon. Just Google Urbantasm or my name, Connor Coyne, if, if Urbantasm's hard to spell. Um, <laughs> and, uh, it's hard to pronounce at times from Urbantasm. Yeah, yeah okay. Urbantasm. I got it. No, see, give and me 200 can, trials. I can do it. You know. the, yeah. Well, I've, I've had plenty of practice. And then also if you go to Urbantasm.com, there's information on the whole series. And, you know, that includes, like, you know, interviews and media and, and stuff like that. So, And also check out the other books, Hungry Rats, Shattering Glass, and Atlas. Yeah. So, I mean, and he's a local guy. I know, you know, he's not too far from the neighborhood of the studio's at. So um, I really want to see him succeed, but not succeed, but I don't want you to move out of the area, obviously, because, you know. I don't, I don't want to either. I don't want to see an empty house. No, no me neither. <laughs> so, anyway, hey, thanks again, and um, we'll hope that you'll have you in the next um when the next book comes out, before that, we'll have you in there. Maybe you talk about, maybe you could do something about a book you like, you didn't write, but you want to talk about. Oh, I would love to do that. Yeah, wouldn't that be cool? Yes, I'll have to spend a long time thinking about what book, though, because there are so many. But yes, I yeah, love that idea. Maybe bring a couple of your friends in there to talk, hash out a book, or why you like it. That is a great idea. Yeah, because we want to expand it. This is all points, and we want to bring in more stuff than just the, I'd always expand stuff. Yeah. I like to expand, you know, what we do, you know, what we cover, so... I'm open oh. for it, you know. Yeah, no, that's a great that's a great idea. Well, thanks again for coming in, Connor. Thanks okay. for having me.